So hello, my name's Simon Canning. Uh, I'm the chair of the Hydrographic Society in Scotland. I'd like to welcome you all to another Hydrographic Society and Norwegian Offshore Survey and Positioning Forum joint event. We've got three excellent speakers this evening, all speaking around the subject of North Sea decommissioning. Now, I know that you'll all be itching to ask uh, some in-depth and challenging questions of our presenters this evening. So if you wish to do so, uh, please ask your questions in the comments section on YouTube. I'll compile them and ask them on your behalf. So first of all, this evening we have uh, Professor Richard D. Nielsen. Hi, Richard. How are you? Hi, thanks. Very well, thank you. Good, good. Mm -hmm. I'll just do your uh, intro and we'll get underway. So uh, we have first up, we've got Professor Richard D. Nielsen. He's the uh, Centre Director at the National Decommissioning Centre. And his presentation this evening is an overview on decommissioning on the UK continental shelf. Richard has 34 years experience in engineering research and development with the university sector, with much of his research undertaken in association with industry. He's currently director of the National Decommissioning Centre. Most of his research has involved application of design and dynamic analysis uh, in solving engineering problems. From 98 to 2002, Richard spent four years on part-time industrial secondment to an oil services company. And since then, much of his research has been in the context of oil and gas, subsea engineering and decommissioning. So over to you, Richard. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Simon. So I think I'll just give a quick overview then of, of, of my overview, as it were. Um, so I'll give you a quick overview of the National Decommissioning Centre, because I suspect many of you have never come across it. I'll then go through um, decommissioning workflow, what we'd expect to find in a decommissioning project, some relevant rate legislation, how you go about planning a decommissioning programme, some um, data about cost estimation of, of um, decommissioning the continental shelf, a little bit about options for topside and jacket decommissioning. And then we're going to look at an example, which is BP Miller, just um, in a couple of slides there as well. So the, the National, Cent National Decommissioning Centre is a partnership between OGC and the University of Aberdeen. We launched in 2019. Um, OGC is investing about 12.7 million over seven years as part of Aberdeen City Region deal. And the University is about 5.0 million pounds um, over the same period, mostly building facilities and staff time and PhD support. And we've got a need of getting match support from industry, and we're working on that at the moment. Um, we've also been very fortunate to have some supplementary income from the Scottish Government's Decommissioning Challenge Fund, so we have about £4 million of infrastructure funding from there. The, the aim of the, pro the centre was to be a global lead in research and development that transforms decommissioning and mature field management. But with the change, um, with climate change and... Um, the move towards energy transition, we're actually straining to the re regions of energy transition as well, and, and particularly repurposing. Um, University of Aberdeen is not a huge university, a good size, but, but the idea was to set up a, a cluster system where we'll link up with other re research institutions, um, innovation centres, both UK and internationally, and we started doing that. And the idea is to take the, the sum of those and make, make something which is more than the, the, the sum of the parts. Um, but because we're partly funded through the region deal, and um, we also have a requirement to um, assist the supply chain. So the idea is not just to be doing research for researchers' sake, but actually to try and help build the UK supply chain um, to, to deliver both UK and internationally. At the moment, we've got um, major partners in Chevron. We've got a three and a half year pro program with them and three projects around the environmental aspects of decommissioning and one in structural degradation. We've got Shell as a partner, and we're looking at long-term post-decommissioning monitoring structures left in place with them. We've got partnerships um, across the world. Um, so we're working with Chilongorn University in Thailand, one of the shipyards looking at onshore dismantling. Um, work with Curtin University around risk assessment of mercury and naturally occurring radioactive materials in the marine environment. So if a pipeline gets breached, what are the risks? Or if it's left in place, what are the risks? And we've just um, linked up with Essex University to look at a project they've called quantifying blue carbon stores around man-made structures. So the effect of, of storage of carbon around man-made structures. We've got 10 PhDs running at the moment and about three more to start. We've got three postdocs undertaking some of this work. And we've got some tech development going on as well, particularly around the area of underwater laser cutting. And that's with a company called Claxton. So that just gives you a very quick overview of, of what we're doing. 
So let, let's jump into the kind of um, look at decommissioning itself. So this is um, an offshore decommissioning workflow. It comes from a document published by Oil & Gas UK back in 2015, and it kind of outlines the overall structure of a decommissioning program. So on the far left, we've got the operations in late life. So we're still producing this point. We then have that point with a red arrow, which says COP, which is cessation of production, at which point we stop producing oil and gas and we go into warm suspension. Um, at that point, the, the wells which produced are still alive, uh, but we're in the process of plugging and abandoning those. So we're in the process of blocking them. And once that's happened and, and the system's been cleaned, we end up in cold suspension. Um, so that might be either manned, we may still have people on board the, the platform at that point, or it could be cold suspension unmanned with, with nobody on board. And then we go on to the removal process. So we, we, we look at start both topside and jacket removal and any subsea infrastructure, and we then get to the point of full removal. Um, and then we've got dismantling and disposal, and that's usually an onshore um, activity. And then finally, the bit what they've called surveillance, quite often called, called long-term monitoring. So the relevant legislation which drives all this, um, one of the overarching ones is the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, which bans dumping at sea. Um, so it's, it's from back in 1982. The, the um, UK has its own legislation, and that's the Petroleum Act 1988. And within that, um, there's a statement that, that basically if a person wants to um, decommission, an installation or subsea pipeline um, and begin that or, or continue that, they need to ask permission of the Secretary of State um, in relation to that installation or pipeline. And the consequence of this is that decommissioning needs to be approved by the Oil and Gas Authority in terms of shutdown and the Offshore Petroleum Regulator for Environment Decommissioning um, Operate, which is part of BASE. And the other relevant piece of legislation is OSPAR Decision 98.3. So this is a uh, an agreement which came in place in 98 and the universe the uk is a signatory to that and it assumes that all installations will, will be completely removed but it gives cases where you're actually allowed to leave things um, on the seabed and those cases are for seal structures which weigh more than 10,000 tons in air and they were installed before 1999 february 99 and the derogation there the allowance is that you can actually leave part of the footings part of the, the mounting or all of the mounting um, but you've got to take most of the jacket out. Um, there's also derogation allowed for gravity-based concrete installations, and, and we're going to hear a little bit more about um, that later on this evening, as far as I understand. And, and also for any other disused offshore structures, which has suffered unforeseen um, structural damage or deterioration. So one classic case for that is that um, the Piper Alpha is still on the seabed in the North Sea, partly as a grave and, and partly because it would actually be difficult to remove. And OSPAR requires that if we are going to leave any, we're going to use one of these derogation cases and leave something in the seabed, and that would also include pipelines, although they're not covered by OSPAR, we've got to undertake a comparative assessment of the decommissioning options. And that assessment's got to include full removal and potential for reuse, as well as other things in terms of leaving. And the case of the point of that is to show that derogation case is the best option. I say OPRED um, needs this for pipelines as well. So if you're going to leave a pipeline in place, you'll have to do a comparative assessment. Again, to show that um, it's more difficult or less environmentally friendly or less safe um, to take the pipeline out. So if we look at how a, a decommissioning program planning process works, I'm sorry if this is a bit boring, there, there are five key stages. Um, the first is early discussions with OPRED, the, the regulator. And that will be looking at um, screening possibilities around pipelines, gathering data, so looking at the environment, um, looking at inventory of materials on the platform and the jacket, looking at things like cuttings piles, so a lot of um, survey work. And then we move into stage two, where we have more detailed discussion with OPRED, uh, and then a beginning assessment of the options and this comparative assessment I mentioned, um, and, and addressing of risk. And, and at that point, we're, we're beginning to develop the actual um, decommissioning plan. And if, if there is going to be derogation, that's the point at which um, you would apply to OSPAR and start having discussions with OSPAR as well. Stage three is the draft decommissioning plan is, is submitted um, under, under the um, 1998 Act. And then we actually get into the physical decommissioning side of things. So work commences in stage four. Um, there's a regular updates to OPRED and how that's progressing and any revisions need to be discussed with OPRED as well. And then finally, we've got stage five, which is closeout. 
So close out report, um, update Opred on any changes or, or changes to the program, and also update Opred on, on what's going to happen long-term monitoring and site remediation. So I mentioned OGA, the Oil and Gas Authority, and Operator both involved. And this, this kind of gives you a little bit of a linkage as to who's involved where. So in the center, we've got the operator or duty holder. Um, Oil and Gas Authority sits above, and, and their primary role is looking at discussion on timing of cessation of production and well plug-in abandonment. Um, the Offshore Petroleum Regulator for Environment Decommissioning is the, the primary person for the, the decommissioning plan. So ongoing discussions, then the final plan submission. But we also have on the left-hand side, the health and safety executive, and that will be around the discussions of any safety issues for the, the decommissioning plan. And that will, that will be things like change the safety case, that once wells are plugged and abandoned and there's no hydrocarbons on, on the asset, then the safety case changes. There, there's less risk at that point, and therefore you can change your operating procedures. And then at the bottom, we've got the National Environmental Protection Agencies, so SEPA for Scotland. Um, and that's discussions around environmental issues, um, any potential um, mitigation, but also um, all, all the sides of things in terms of waste management. In terms of decommissioning cost, if you look for the continental shelf, um, Oil and Gas Authority did a baseline study back in 2017. At that point, they estimated the cost to be 59.7 billion for complete removal. Uh, and at that point, they also set a 35% cost reduction target. And um, so they were hoping to get down to a, a cost of less than 39 billion. And bear in mind that, that some of this will effectively be borne by the taxpayer because um, companies can offset their decommissioning against tax and previous tax. So that's money that would not come into the, um, the exchequer. In 2020, there was an update on that. And based on, on the kind of calculations around the 2017 inventory and prices, the estimated cost had come down to 48 billion. But if we then scale up to allow for more recent prices and also the fact there's actually slightly more out there now, and this comes up to about 51 billion. So this is a, a Document. This is um, all in OG UK's um, decommissioning insight report, 2020, and this this shows a kind of breakdown of the main areas. So we've got project management, post um, COP running costs, well decommissioning, and so on. But what you can pick out of this is that um, the biggest items are are well decommissioning. So that accounts for 49 percent of the cost. And if you look down the bottom right hand corner, it's, it's about 15 billion um, over the next 10 years. So well decommissioning that. And the other big chunk then is topside and substructure removal, which accounts for about 14% between the two of them. And then we've got subsea infrastructure, so pipelines, manifolds, um, templates, things like that. Interestingly, if you look at number eight, which is the onshore processing side, it's only 2% of the cost. It's probably the most obvious to people, but it's actually one of the smaller bits of cost. So let's, let's have a look at some of the bits of decommissioning. So, I mentioned that the wells are probably the, the most expensive part, or by far the most expensive part. And um, this, this could take several hours if I went into detailed well PA side of things. But but effectively all wells need to be plugged and abandoned, left in a safe state. And at the moment, most wells are plugged using cement. So across on this side of the, the picture, we've got a set of wells with a zone A and zone B, and we've got a cement plug above zone B, then we've got two plugs above zone A. And, and these are designed to be permanent plugs to stop. Um, any hydrocarbons coming up. And that can be quite, cement seems like a very cheap material, but actually be quite costly to make really good bonds and make sure that things are good. Cost reduction for this area is likely to come through either improved efficiency as contractors become more proficient, and um, also with, with collaboration between operators working together to provide joint scopes of work or campaigns to maximize efficiency. So a number of operators getting together and then working through a scope of work, which then becomes almost like a bulk buy. But also new rigless technologies like bismuth alloys and thermite plugs, and these are these are things which don't require cement. They have better, potentially better bonding qualities, and therefore maybe quicker and easier to implement. So I want to go through a couple of um, of the options for topside decommissioning, then um, jacket decommissioning, and then we'll have a look at Miller. And um, so options for removing a topside. One is, one is single lift by heavy lift vessel, and one of the examples would be. So one of the small platforms, Shell Indy Lima, which is about 1,448 tonnes. So that's that's it. picture on the right-hand side. It's quite a small southern North Sea um, platform. 
Then you have the single lift by hydraulic lift, um, lights of pioneer spin. I'm not going to dwell on that. That's the things like the Shell Brent, which is 24,000 tons at the top side. Um, so the Brent, the Brent um, superstructures. And then we've got reverse installations. This is lifting off module by module off the top side with a heavy lift SRO semi sub crane uh, in reverse order. And a typical example of that would be BP Miller. And I'll talk a little, a little bit more about that in, in, in a couple of slides' time. And the other way of doing things is what's called piece small. Uh, and this is effectively chopping things up in little bits, uh, putting them in containers and shipping them ashore. And that, that was done with Shell's in the Kilo platform. And that, that picture down the right hand side is that. And, and that center deck area was the bit that was used to be able to, to work and, and cut onto. And um, so that there was space to demolish things on the, on the rig itself. Options for jacket decommissioning. Again, we've got single lift um, by heavy lift vessel. And, and again, a small jacket, the Indy Lima one was 836 tons, very quite an easy lift. Um, and we'll come back to there are big, much bigger lifts than that since then. Um, but also piece small, and an example of that would be BP Northwest Hutton. So this was a 17,500 ton jacket. It, it was taken apart using 204 to eight subsea cuts. So you can imagine that the, the difficulty of doing that. There were 59, uh, 58 lifts to remove over 9,000 tons. Um, and the heaviest of those lifts was around um, 2,250 tons. So a lot of work, a uh, big scope of work for doing this um, in terms of doing piece small on a jacket. So let's have a look at um, reverse installations. This is BP Miller. So the, the picture on your right is, is the Miller. Um, this is a post, um, oh, post the major accident. And um, so the, the, the setup of this, this platform is slightly different. Um, from, from the ones previous before Piper Alpha. Um, there's more space between them, and therefore it was slightly easier to remove. Um, it's a big top side, it's 28,732 tons in, in 12 modules, big jacket, 18,000 tons. So top side was removed by reverse installation and by SIPEM between August 2017, and it was completed in 2018, so it was a campaign over two years. And the jacket was removed in 2018 um, in single lift with derogation of the footing. So not the whole jacket was taken out um, and that was shipped ashore on the crane hooks. So this, this shows you a little bit of left-hand side shows you the modules. And one of the big advantages of this um, project was that the original lifting points were still in place. So um, some other older structures, the lifting points have been removed. You've got to go back in and rebuild them, recertify them before you can lift. Uh, Miller was much better because it could be inspected and then lifted. And you can see across on the left-hand side here, you can see the various modules, but you can also see from the two arrows here that some of these were lifted off combined. So this module, the accommodation module and the exhaust tower were lifted off together. So rather than lifting off one at a time, um, they were lifted off together. Actually, I may have got that wrong. It might be the um, the one, sorry, power generation, sorry, and the exhaust tower came off together. Um, so th this was done and in some cases, these were carried ashore on the hooks of the crane. So rather than putting on a barge or transferring onto the lift vessel, they were actually transferred um, while still in the crane hooks. And this is quite an interesting one because um, the BP Miller set up, BP set up a partnership. Um, so BP appointed Saipem, uh, sorry, Petrofac as duty holder for the decommissioning process. And then BP contracted Saipem as the, the lifting contractor. There was no direct contract between Petrofac and uh, Saipem. However, to, to make things work well, BP co-located the teams to ensure efficient delivery, and that, that worked really well. There are also some really interesting things in this because um, to try and minimize the number of lifts, um, BP decided they would lift the flare tower along with the drilling and well deck. Well deck. Um, so you can see this, this picture on the right here, we've got a module here and the flare tower. Normally you take the flare tower off and it'd be a lot easier, but this was actually taken to shore uh, in what they call the lift and carry operation. So this was taken to shore on the crane hooks and um, taken across the Norway for, for um, dismantling. And to kind of de-risk some of that, there was some scale modeling testing and some other um, simulation work undertaken. So this, this turned out to be actually a very cost-effective and safe outcome. It, seem, it seems quite Dangerous. And in the bottom picture you can see down here is, is the lift of the jacket. So it's a single lift of the jacket um, using the two cranes of, of the, the Saipem 7000. So 
just for a finish, I just want to mention there are still challenges around decommissioning. So I've, I've shown you some of the, the things that have happened, some successes, but, but there are still quite a lot of challenges around decommissioning the North Sea. Um, one of the biggest is, is further cost reduction before the, beyond the 17% achieved so far. So we, some of the, the easy gains have been made and, and it will become harder. At, at, the estimate is that some of this, this gain will come through um, collaboration. So I've also mentioned collaboration between operators as being um, a challenge, but, but it will reduce cost. And um, there's also a challenge around decommissioning while minimizing emissions with the move towards net zero. Um, there is a very much a, a pinch point possibly coming, and one of those will be possible competition with renewables for resources. So, so lights of will heavy lift vessels and jack up rigs be available, or will they be out installing wind farms or possibly decommissioning wind farms in the, in the future as well? And there are also some challenges around something I haven't mentioned at this point, which is liability and perpetuity, which is the operators are liable forever for anything they leave in the sea, and that may drive decisions. Um, either it may mean that people leave things but it may or ask for derogation but it may also mean that things get pulled out but it does mean that that operators need to think about that long-term liability and i'll close at that point and hopefully we'll have some questions that was excellent thanks very much richard um well yep we've got we've got um a few questions here um so the you you were talking about the workflow um there so how, how long would a workflow uh, nominally be or, or you, you, what is your average workflow or is there is there a specific amount of time or does a larger structure take more time than another or it, it might depend on the program so so typically operate would want you to start looking at the project five years before cessation production and removal um but the actual the workflow will depend on, on how many wells there are in terms of plug-in abandonment, which is one of the big bits, but also how you do it. I, I'd also I mean likes of um, BP actually left Miller as a as a an emergency helicopter port effectively for a short period as well. So although they'd they'd stop production, um, it was a while before the, the, the cushioning program kicked in mm -hmm. because they were for something else at that point. Um, but it, it it might be several years. I mean. It, it depends on the complexity of the problem to some extent. Uh, yeah, okay. So you start five years beforehand and it kind of runs up till the last minute or well no, you don't, no, no. So I mean your your five years plan would be in planning what you're going to do in terms of the program. Mm. But during that time you'll also be in discussion with the supply chain as to what you're going to use in terms of the vessels or, or whatever else. Okay. So so what what how does the NDC kind of fit into fit into that process then? So in terms of work plan, I guess we're we're trying to help companies get um, information. So some of the work we're doing with Chevron is looking around whether it's better to leave things in place. And, and a lot of work they're doing is in Gulf of Thailand. And there's an option there to leave in place. Um, the work we're doing with um, Shell is looking at if you leave something in place, the long term monitoring piece, which is a, a legal rec um, requirement. Um, but we're also building um, we've just put in a marine simulator and that will allow us to trial new technologies um, before they're trialed in real life. So we've got a simulator which allows us to run two cranes, two vessels and, and simulate a decommissioning program or decommissioning operation. Um, so we're making that available to, to companies to come in. Okay, would, okay, would, would you would say you that say the, say UK the UK has, UK a, has, a, has a, a large uh, has a lot of companies or as a as a a comprehensive supply chain to to call upon because I noticed uh, obviously the the UK based companies the operators but I noticed you had Cypem in there taking structures off to Norway so what would would there be a much UK involvement uh, in 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 its own in disposable of its own assets? So I guess the the lift side of things the heavy lift side of things is not one where the UK is well. Um, supplied, I would guess. Um, the, the main contractors being Herma, Saipem, and All Seas. Um, so, so those are the big heavy lift contractors, and obviously none of them are UK. So, so the big stuff really does happen um, is is overseas. In terms of onshore disposal, um, uh, as we'll see, some of the reason um, Miller went to Norway was that the, the Saipem required deep water port, and the UK didn't have one at that point where they could bring it in. But, but there are other ways around this, as you'll see with with, with Shell Brent, 
where you could put on a barge and bring it into a shallow water port. Um, th there's there's a lot of very good skills base in terms of some of the specialist stuff for, for um, decommissioning in the UK. And do you, do you see that increasing over time, the, the involvement or, or, or will it, yeah. or will the status quo remain? Do you, do you anticipate? Um, well, I think, I think there'll be more happening. Uh, I think there are more companies getting involved in decommissioning. There are certainly more ports looking at how they might facilitate onshore side of things. And there are companies um, looking at how, rather than using heavy lift vessels, you might use buoyancy systems to bring stuff into shallow water ports. Mm -hmm. So there was a company called Ardent who were looking at uh, what they call the Archimedes system, and that was using a, a buoyancy, set of buoyancy tanks to, to bring jackets ashore. So th there are opportunities, I think, um, for the UK, uh, and, uh, and th there are definitely more companies getting involved. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's interesting to know. Thank you. Um, as far as the, 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 the decommissioning process goes and the planning, um, when you're, you know, when, when say you're planning cuts on a jacket, or say you're planning removal of modules, um, what what is the process? I'm just wondering specifically if there's any kind of 3D visualization involved in that in the planning process. Say any modelling work that goes on to remove or, or or plan cuts or remove modules or plan lifts. So that, that's definitely coming in. Um, so th there's certainly a lot of survey work. So a lot of people using point cloud scans um, to build models, to get better ideas of, of what's out there. And that's partly because um, the as-built drawings will not be the same as the as-is now. Um, so, so you'll find there are, there are stairways where they went on the drawings and various other things. So there's a lot of work going out doing scanning, either photogrammetry or, or, or point cloud. Um, and that then allows you to do, to, to do some of that visualization work and, and see mm -hmm. whether you're going to have a clash with something. And, and this comes back to the work I was talking about with the simulator. We could, we could effectively trial a, a lift system um, in a virtual environment and see what's going to happen, including environmental conditions. So we're, we're, we're mm -hmm. talking about waves and wind and whatever else as well. So, so that, that is definitely becoming in. Um, and I think as, as operators build more what we call digital twins into their new systems, when it comes to decommissioning, um, those visualization systems, I think, will aid the decommissioning and the decommissioning plan. Okay. Um, so you also mentioned um, kind of the, there might there may be some pinch points going forward between um, decommissioning uh, oil and gas assets and decommissioning uh, renewable assets. So, um, what what who 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 would you say wins out of the two? Should it should that pinch point arise? Well, that's a great. That's a, I, and it might be installation of wind as well. Actually, so I mean, if you looked at the, the, the wind farm out at, um, in the Aberdeen Bay here, I mean that was put in with a jack up rig, and well, the yeah bits of the were put in with jack up rig. Um, so I, I guess it will come down to cost. Who 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 pays most? Who I suspect. Pays the most, eh? <laughs> yeah, but but. But the other thing is that the, the there may be a move from some of the contractors that they will know that this you know they got a one-off lift from an operator, but they've got a thousand turbines to put in for somebody else. <laughs> so you know, so it, it it may come down to I mean it's not an easy gameplay to see at the moment. I, um, but but definitely there is there is there is a likelihood of there being this kind of pinch point oh, as, as the way it wins that's it. it it will depend both on how the market sits and whether a company would rather have a five-year stream of um wind farm installation or a very high profile very expensive oil and gas lift yeah yeah okay so yeah well we'll look we'll look out for that going <laughs> forward in the future aren't we and uh, see if we can meet our the targets that we've promised as well if the, if there is that if there are those pinch points yeah. as well and see if they will see if they will feed into our target meeting um okay well, I could go on for ages as usual but um I think um we'll we'll, we'll call it a day there Richard so thank you very much uh, we we've got, we've we've reached our time limit as usual so thanks ever so much that was really interesting really enjoyed it and uh, we've had plenty of great questions there so thank you yeah so thanks for the questions it's been really good actually thanks okay pleasure all right
Okay, up next uh, we have uh, Andy Matkin. Hi, Hi Andy, there. how Hi, are you? Very well, thank you. Yourself? Good, good, yeah. Fine, fine and dandy as ever. So I'll, I'll just give you an intro before you kick off. Um, so Andy Matkin, Commercial Manager for Environmental Services at Fugro. Uh, Andy's subject this evening is decommissioning an environmental survey perspective. Uh, so Andy's a marine environmental scientist with 14 years experience specialising in marine environmental survey services, primarily for the offshore oil and gas and renewable industries, aka the energy industry these days. Andy has experience in survey design, environmental data collection and subsequent analysis and reporting. Andy joined Fugro at the start of 2018 as the general manager of Fugro's environmental office in Edinburgh and currently leads the environmental commercial team. Prior to this, he spent three years in Houston in a business development role for a marine survey company, developing environmental services uh, within North and Latin America. He has held project management roles focusing on environmental, geochemical and multidisciplinary surveys, including the successful management of multi-client regional environmental surveys in West Africa. And he represents FUGRA on the SUT, DCOM and Rec Removal Subcommittee and on the Marine Environmental Science Special Interest Group. He's also a member of IMAR EST. He's a chartered, sci chartered scientist and chartered marine scientist. Fantastic. Well, um, over to you, Andy. We look forward to this. Thank you very much, Simon. So I'm going to give a... Uh an environmental survey perspective of, of decommissioning. I'm going to talk a little bit about the techniques we use to collect data, uh, how that data can be presented to the operators, uh, and touch on a couple of the challenges that are faced. But before uh, I do that, I'm going to um, briefly uh, start off looking at uh, why we conduct environmental surveys. As Richard uh, pointed out, this is uh, driven through, through national legislation. And in the UK, that is the Petroleum Act of 1998. As part of this act, which is administered by OPRED, uh, operators have a requirement to develop decommissioning plans. Uh, and those decommissioning plans uh, include uh, environmental assessment. In addition to national legislation, we have international conventions, uh, such as OSPAR, uh, which are often transpose into international legislation. Uh, example would be uh, decision 98.3 that Richard covered earlier and also decision 2006.5 which is uh, targeted around uh, assessing drill cutting piles, uh, their size and, and likely um, longevity. We also have uh, best practice guidelines. There is OSPAR 2004.11 which um, recommends that environmental surveys are conducted prior to installations uh, going in during the lifetime of those installations uh, and again after they have been removed. There's also guidelines such as OSPAR 1703E and the Nord Oil and Gas Guidelines that are specific to cutting piles uh, looking at the uh, technologies available for sampling them and also uh, the analysis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Southern North Sea uh, environments. Um, as part of the environmental uh, appraisals, um, where there's often no uh, cutting piles present due to the tidal uh, dynamics in the region, um, we start off by assessing the, the environmental conditions through the collection of geophysical data. There's a couple of examples here from the ENI uh, Hewitt environmental appraisal. Um, we've got some cytogan sonar and some multiple echo sounder data. So we, we generally collect this data to understand uh, the various uh, habitats uh, that could be present uh, in the uh, environment. Another example here from Spirit Energy uh, Ensign decommissioning environmental appraisal, uh, again looking at the, the sonar and the, the multi-beam that is present across the site. Once we've collected the geophysical data, uh, we generally ground truth it using uh, a variety of uh, seabed imagery techniques. Uh, it's an example of a, a drop-down camera system. Uh, and then on the bottom right, we've got um, a Sabula spinulosa reef, which is an Annex 1 habitat. Uh, so this is something of uh, sensitive uh, importance that we'll be looking out for. As part of ground truthing, we also collect sediment samples. These could be for uh, biological, uh, chemical um, or physical analysis. So when we have collected uh, data, um, be that um, 
seabed imagery. Um, we look to uh, assess, uh, identify all the, the species living on the seabed. Uh, example here of how that data has been uh, presented in a ENI Hewitt environmental appraisal. We also look to analyze uh, the contents of our grab samples. This could be through uh, collection of benthic macrofauna, which is the species living within the sediment that is, is greater than a, a sieve size. Um, so in Southern North Sea, it's typically a one millimeter sieve used uh, due to the, the size of uh, the sediment. And we identify everything that is greater than that one millimeter sieve. We also collect samples for particle size analysis to understand what the, uh, the grain size is, uh, and also a variety of uh, chemical analysis. This uh, illustrates how we can uh, utilize the geophysical data um, to map uh, Annex 1 habitats. Uh, we start off collecting the geophysics. Um, we then identify areas of potential uh, seabed and habitat change. We ground truth that using our video camera systems. We then identify, we then analyze the video footage and still images, identify the species present and do an ecological uh, assessment based on um, matching uh, the data against established Annex 1 uh, criteria. So in case of uh, a Sabellaria uh, reef, we'd be looking at um, the elevation, its patchiness and its uh, consolidation and assessing how well it represents a reef, either not at all, uh, low, medium or high resemblance. And then once we've done that, we can then uh, overlay the data uh, back on the, the geophysics to, to show the extent of these features. This data can be presented to regulators in a number of ways. This is an example from the Spirit Energy Ensign Decommissioning Environmental Appraisal, uh, where the different uh, colour types represent different sediment types uh, and habitats present in the area. We can also overlay the data on the geophysics. So the left hand image shows the extent of uh, Sabellaria spinulosa um, as the uh, blue hashed area uh, and the different colours represent uh, the video and images that were assessed as uh, different uh, levels of uh, reefiness. The middle uh, image uh, shows uh, similar uh, results, also depicting some of the uh, still images that were acquired uh, during the survey, both of those from the Spirit Energy Environmental Appraisal. And then on the right hand side, we have an example from the NR Hewitt Environmental Appraisal looking uh, at the uh, a stony reef assessment. Uh, it's another Annex 1 habitat. So in Southern North Sea environments where there, there's no cutting piles, there's a lot of focus on um, the seabed imagery uh, and conf comparing the, uh, the baseline uh, conditions to, to what we see uh, now. However, in the Northern North Sea, uh, we quite often come across uh, cutting piles. In the 70s, 80s and 90s, it was common practice uh, that drill discharges were released uh, in situ. Um, and due to the uh, lower hydrodynamic uh, conditions, uh, the tidal, lower tidal conditions, uh, those often uh, accumulated um, around the drill locations. So as part of um, OSPAR 2006-5, we need to understand the position of the cutting piles, the volume of the cutting piles, uh, and the pile area and topography. It's an example here of Murchison, um, where uh, the cutting pile had a, a height in excess of 15 metres, a surface area of uh, nearly 7,000 metres squared, and a volume of over 22,000 metres cubed. Another example from the Dunlin Alpha, uh, drill cutting technical report. This has got a slightly uh, lower height at just under 13 metres, but it's got a, a larger surface area at over 9,000 metres squared, uh, a volume of uh, over 19,000 metres cubed. Once we've used geophysics, uh, quite often uh, a vessel, uh, sorry, quite often an ROV uh, with uh, mounted multi beam and sonar to assess the, uh, the area of uh, cutting poles, we then need to, to ground truth it. This is undertaken uh, using a couple of different uh, techniques. Uh, the first is looking at collecting uh, sufficient sediment samples uh, for chemical and biological analysis. And this can be done using uh, grab samplers and, and box scores. This can be done from, uh, from vessel deployed systems uh, in stations further away, or can also be deployed using uh, ROV deployed uh, grab samplers and, and box scores. There's also a need to collect longer cores from uh, of the, of the cutting pile. Uh, and this is uh, traditionally done using things like ROV uh, push cores, uh, piston cores, and, and vibro cores. 
there's a variety of uh, analysis that are performed uh, on those samples. Some of them are uh, total hydrocarbon uh, concent concentration, uh, the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PCBs, organotins, uh, alkaphenols and alkaphenol extrotholates, uh, metal analysis, particularly uh, things like uh, total barium, uh, where um, barite has been used in, in the drilling muds. We also look at the, the marine biology, uh, the macrofauna again, uh, and some of the uh, normal analysis, uh, naturally occurring radioactive material. As part of uh, OSPAR 2006-5, uh, one of the things we're really looking out for is the, the total hydrogen concentration uh, and where it is above the 50 milligrams per kilogram or 50 uh, ppm. We're also looking at the, uh, the duration that this level continues for, and this is expressed as square kilometer years. This data can be presented uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, Left-hand images from the Dunlin Alpha uh, Cuttings Technical Report. It's a heat map essentially, where the areas uh, darker uh, brown located uh, closest to the uh, the platform um, show the higher concentrations of uh, THC. And then as we move further away from the, the platform, the uh, concentration decreases back towards background levels. On the right, we've got an example from Murchison, uh, where again, the larger pie graphs are um, in close proximity to the platform. And as we go further away, uh, the size decreases, uh, illustrating a, a decrease in uh, THC. We also see that the stations closest to the platform have a, a much higher uh, percentage of uh, drilling fluid present. Uh, and again, this decreases as the distance from the platform decreases. A couple of things to, to point out on, uh, on this figure, uh, again from Murchison. Um, there's a few uh, dots on the uh, right-hand side here. Um, the darker black dots are from 1987, uh, pink is from 1990, and the blue is from 1993. Uh, what we're seeing is that as uh, time goes on, the level of uh, THC uh, decreases, uh, suggesting that there is some uh, return towards more of a, a baseline condition. Those stations are located uh, upstream of the platform. Uh, and the other thing uh, we can see is um, stations located downstream of the platform generally have a, a higher level of uh, THC, which is not, not surprising. The red dots are from uh, the latest survey taken in 2011. Uh, if we go from left to right, we see uh, the first few dots up until a distance perhaps uh, 750 metres uh, from the platform all have a fairly uh, consistent level uh, of THC, uh, suggesting this is um, representative of background, background levels. At about 500 metres, there's, there's an increase, and this uh, goes uh, quickly up as we get very close to uh, the platform. A few images here from Northwest Hutton, uh, showing uh, the seabed recovery and the reduction in the cutting pile over time. So back in 1985, the total cutting pile was uh, estimated to extend uh, between two and a half and 5,000 metres from uh, the platform. But by 99, that had decreased uh, 1,200 to 2,500 metres. And by 2002, it had reduced further to about 800 metres. On the right, we can see the Shannon Weiner diversity values. Uh, this is a way of depicting the uh, biological diversity uh, at the site. Uh, two things to, to highlight here. Uh, generally, as we go further from uh, the Northwest Hutton platform, uh, the higher the uh, Shannon Weiner diversity value is, meaning the more uh, species are, are present in that area. And then the second thing is over time from 92 to 2002, uh, generally there is an increase in the um, diversity values uh, at all stations suggesting that more species are able to, to live and, and thrive in, in those environments, uh, which indicates uh, a reduction in uh, total hydrocarbons. There's very few species that are, are hydrocarbon uh, sensitive, sorry, hydrocarbon uh, tolerant and, and thrive in those environments. Further surveys were done at Northwest Hutton in 2014 or 2015, I believe, and the results were, were published and presented um, at the 16th North Sea Decommissioning Conference. Um, on the rapid recovery of the environment surrounding Northwest Hutton drill cuttings. I want to briefly touch on uh, a couple of challenges. Opportunity Northeast and Scottish Enterprise uh, 
put our decommissioning opportunity in 2020 uh, on drill cutting pile solutions. There was uh, a requirement, they identified there was a, there was challenges in uh, obtaining uh, samples in, in compact cutting piles uh, and it's difficult to obtain samples to go all the way through the cutting pile into uh, the underlying seabed. There are a number of reasons uh, for this, um, partly uh, because of any um, debris um, that has come from uh, the platforms uh, and also um, you can get um, grout layers within cutting piles uh, that make it very difficult to, to penetrate through. Also, in certain cases, the cutting piles are incredibly deep. Uh, we showed examples of a couple of cutting piles at 13 to, to 15 meters, um, and uh, ROV uh, push cores uh, are limited to um, half meter to, to a meter due to the uh, the thrust of the ROV and being able to get the core to go in uh, vertically, as well as the uh, compact nature of the cutting piles. So they were really looking at uh, technologies uh, that may be with the industry to obtain deeper. Uh, samples. Uh, there were a couple of um, op options using um, ROV deployed uh, piston cores that use two core. Um, the first one goes in as far as it can, that acts as an anchor, which allows the second core to, to go in deeper, and you can kind of push one off against the other, increasing your, your depth penetration. The other point I'd like to, to highlight this uh, a challenge for the industry is marine growth. So if we have some cold water coal growing on the seabed, uh, that could constitute an Annex 1 habitat and be of uh, environmental uh, importance and significance. However, if that same cold water coal is growing on uh, the structure of, of an oil and gas platform, that doesn't constitute an Annex 1 habitat, even though it may be uh, feeding a, a marine reserve uh, in the area due to larval dispersal. Because of the way uh, the legislation is at the moment, uh, any uh, marine growth on structures cannot be included in comparative assessments. So it's important to an operator from uh, a stability and a, a, an ease of decommissioning, but its environmental significance can't be included uh, in these assessments. There's some research going on uh, through Insight, uh, the, uh, effect of, uh, the effect of man-made structures on the marine uh, environment um, that is looking at um, at topics like this, uh, trying to ascertain the importance of um, man-made structures um, and the growth on them for uh, populating uh, the wider uh, natural area, but also the ability that these uh, marine structures might have uh, as being a stepping stone for invasive species. There's just a link to some of the, uh, the reports that uh, I've mentioned during uh, the presentation. Hope you found that interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Andy. That was excellent. Uh, we really found that interesting. And it's a, a useful insight, I think, into um, a subject that uh, we don't often hear very much about. So thank you for that. That was great. Um, we've got um, a couple of questions here. So from uh, we've got a couple of questions from Nikki. Uh, firstly, saying hello, Andy. Um, are you seeing an increase in the amount of environmental decommissioning analysis that is required under new regulations or regulations in general? Under regulations, not yet. I think it's it's more where operators are in their um, their programs uh, due to the the cost uh, nature we're in at the moment. Um, there's potential that more uh, platforms and uh, and installations will need decommissioning uh, sooner than perhaps would have been uh, planned in the past, uh, due to the the ongoing cost of uh, of operating. Uh, equally, as uh, Richard pointed out, the uh, planning process for for decommissioning uh, is quite lengthy. Um, so uh, it's we might what we're seeing come through uh, today in terms of. Um, op operators looking to uh, conduct surveys and things is is looking. Uh, perhaps two, three, four years uh, in advance. Wow, okay. Um, and is um, just a, another question from Nikki. Thank you for that. Um, where do you do most of your processing uh, and, and data analysis? Is that onshore or on board the vessel? So most of that is done uh, onshore. Um, another thing that is, uh, is perhaps changing with uh, the industry and um, Perhaps aided by by COVID, one of the one of the few positives of it, uh, we're seeing a lot more uh, remote operations uh, taking place. 
Um, we still need people on board to to do physical uh, subsampling um, and and look after the, the sediment sample side of things. But when it comes to uh, seabed imagery um, and flying of ROVs and things like that, uh, a lot more of that can be done uh, onshore um, through uh, remote operation centres. So there's there's also a shift within the industry to to try and reduce the number of people um, going offshore uh, and and do more from from an onshore environment. Mm. Uh, do do you think that's a quicker method? Uh, on board vessel or, or, or on shore, or are there pros and cons to both? I think long term, it's definitely going to be more of a, a positive. I think it it enables our clients to to get data and results quicker, um, and to be able to to view what's uh, what's happening. Uh, I think traditionally you had bandwidth image uh, issues on, on vessels uh, and sending data back uh, onshore uh, was a limitation, yeah. which when your onshore client couldn't log in and see what was going on. But if we're, we're sending data back um, for uh, our IV pilots or for our onshore team to, to do environmental assessments, there's no reason why the clients can't see the same data stream coming through and therefore yeah. get a, a first-hand idea of what's going on much quicker than waiting on yeah. a 28-day a uh, port call or something like that. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, that's very interesting. Thanks. Um, now, you, you kind of bear, bear with me with this. So what the purpose of an environmental survey, um, it's an odd question, but what is the purpose? Now, is that what you know just could you give us an overview of what the purpose is now you 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 have explained what goes on and what you do but what's the what's the purpose of it why why would you why do you do it why we do it because not, we, we care trick, about the uh about the marine environment so i think a lot of people um in the industry have a, have a strong passion for for what they do uh, in terms of uh, the legislation obviously uh we don't want there to be uh, a negative impact of, uh, of offshore operations regardless uh, what they are uh, mm -hmm. so we have a, a duty of care to, to try and uh, ensure that the uh, the marine environment is uh, is as left in a, as pristine a condition as possible so okay. uh, we do surveys to, to try and make sure that um, we know what the, the condition is before things uh, happen uh, and then we can sort of monitor uh, the conditions after installations have been in place to, to monitor how we, we get back to that, that baseline condition. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, and okay, so is there any, uh, any, any compulsion? So you, so you do a survey an environmental survey prior to say an installation happening or a, a platform being installed or pipeline or whatever uh, and then you, you kind of do you, you do a, a, an intermediary survey environmental survey and i, I would suspect you notice a, a a downgrade in you know the number of species or say increasing in in, in fluids or or, hi, or hydrocarbons and stuff like that is it am i, am I in the right track and then and then at the decommissioning stage you notice that species kind of increase so is there is there compulsion to speed up the increase in species to how it was before or do you just kind of wait and see what happens and see how quickly that goes so some of that comes into to clients uh um, comparative assessments and, and what remediation that they're they're doing on a on a uh, site. Um, most often, uh, at the moment, the the thought is leaving drill cutting piles uh, in place is uh, is the best uh, thing to do, um, so that the uh, sufficient uh, sediments uh, are generally weathered over time and have a, a lower uh, toxic toxicity uh, and effect on the marine environment. Obviously, as you go deeper down through uh, a cutting pile. Um, you will have uh, higher concentrations uh, of uh, contaminants because they've never been weathered, they've never uh, been dispersed, they've, they've not had uh, exposure to bacteria that will, will break them down, um, essentially eat the, the, the hydrocarbons. Um, that said, um, because of the requirement to, to remove uh, all installation, uh, you sometimes have to move cutting piles from around footings in order to, to cut below your mudline. So you have some requirement to, to move, and it's whether um, you're best off moving uh, the entire cutting pile and, and placing it somewhere else on the seabed, or whether you're, you're better off uh, removing it um, uh, to a vessel and disposing it on shore, which, which still requires disposing of um, 
contaminated material. And these are all elements that, that factor into uh, operators' decommissioning plans, uh, their comparative assessments as to what is the best uh, approach in terms of um, requesting derogation or, or, re or removing the entire structure. Okay, so 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 sometimes it's better just to 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 leave some things be, so to speak. It, it, it can be. Um, obviously, we we have uh, fishing activity that can add a, a an extra uh, dimension to things. Um, if you've removed your uh, your structure uh, and fishing goes uh, goes back over an area, you're going to be stirring up your, your cutting piles, you're going to be putting your contaminated material into your water column and, and spreading over uh, a large area of the seabed, which could have a, a larger um, negative impact. Equally, if you've, if you've left some of the fittings in place and uh, you can't go across that area, um, it's very localized um, and for the wider environment it potentially has a, a greater benefit mm -hmm. okay so so mark mark's asking mark grove smith's asking do you ever completely remove a cutting pile i don't know uh it's, it's an honest answer i think that is something that um an operator would have to consider as to whether that was uh, the best thing to do uh, but i don't uh, know has, has it ever been done in your experience I've not heard of it, but um, that doesn't mean it hasn't been done. I hope that answers your question, Mark. Um, okay, Nikki's got a question for you. Um, well, it, I guess it's just a part of discussion, which I also had. Um, so uh, when you're when you're when you've got a structure, say, and and you've got a lot of marine growth on it. Um, and that and that's becoming, you know, for want of a better expression, a man-made reef, for example. Um, um, what is what is the uh, what is the challenge? I suppose is is there a is there an argument for leaving the structure there and it becoming a reef and it seeding, versus the um, the the legislation which tells you to remove it so is there a, is there a bit of tension there and could you could you just talk about that there's probably not tension at the moment because you have to do what the legislation says and if the legislation says it's got to be removed and you have to ignore your your marine growth then that's ultimately what we have to do but i think there's definitely uh, contention and tension within the the scientific community as to whether that's actually the correct thing to do uh, and whether it is better to to have it as a an artificial reef and to have it uh, in place and that's why there is uh, these research programs going on to, to try and better understand the uh, the impact that these structures have um, and then be able to put the the scientific case through to uh, regulate uh, the regulators to try and get um, the legislation changed where there is a, a good scientific rationale for that legislation to be changed yeah okay and and i guess that that's some of the s studies that are going on at the moment that you alluded to uh with with, with regards to how to c kind of proceed in the future yes indeed uh, what, what, do you do you know if they're erring in a direction at the moment or or a... i think i think it's still uh fairly early stages uh the insight programs in its uh, second phase um and uh, that's, I think, in its second of, uh, of its four-year program. So I think we're a few years off uh, that data being, being published. Um, and I think there's probably a, a time lag between when uh, this set of research and perhaps future research is, is published and when uh, the likes of OSPAR uh, make uh, future recommendations to perhaps change some of the, the meaning of uh, 98 three. Mm, okay. should they ever decide to do so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, that was interesting. Thank you. So, so yeah, I guess so you can make recommendations, and whether they're taken on board or not, and put into legislation is a, is a whole different uh, kettle of fish, I guess, isn't it? Kind it of is. Yes. Kettle of fish. Um, so, just a, another quick question: uh, Is uh, Mark from Mark Grove Smith? Um, he's asking, is DNA analysis used to help identify species? That is a growing um, area uh, of interest, yes. Uh, it's a fairly new emerging uh, technique, um, so it's, we're starting to see it being used uh, more and more. Um, 
it's something that we'll probably see a lot more of uh, in uh, 10, 15 years time. It's like um, most technologies, uh, it takes uh, time to uh, to get proven and established. Uh, there will be a, a time where it will be run uh, in, convert in, um, in parallel to, to existing uh, techniques uh, and then uh, um, there will likely be uh, cases in the future where it has uh, greater uh, significance. Wow, fantastic! That's interesting. Um, so, so is it is it used a little bit now, or it is used a little bit? Um, perhaps uh, more on some of the uh, larger um, environmental uh, baseline surveys. Um, I've not heard it used too much in in decommissioning uh, to date, but I suspect it will be used uh, more and more yeah. uh, as time goes on. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, Again, I'd like to carry on, but I, I think we've uh, we've reached our time limit, unfortunately. Uh, so thank you very much, Andy. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And, thank you. Uh, thanks, th thanks for your time this evening, and thanks for enlightening us all on uh, a subject that you know, I'm I'm quite ignorant about. So it was it was really interesting. Thanks ever so much for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Uh, thanks again to Andy. Next up, we've got Finlay McPhail from Shell. Hi, Finlay. How are you? Hi. Good evening, Simon. Good evening. Okay. So, uh, Finlay McPhail is a, a decommissioning execution project engineer at uh, Shell UK. Uh, and Finlay will be talking about uh, the removal of the Brent Alpha platform. So Finlay is a civil engineer by training and has been with Shell for eight years, starting in the Netherlands and working at a range of Shell locations, including Norway, Qatar and Australia. For the last two years, he's been based in Aberdeen, working on the safe removal and dismantling of the Brent Alpha platform. Currently, Finlay is managing project managing the removal of the GoldenEye platform. So this will be of interest to us, Finlay, because we've we've used the GoldenEye platform in a, in, a, in as a as a project example in some of our some of our other events. So uh, yeah, we know a little bit about it. So I'm um, interested to hear more. So over to you. Okay, Simon, thank you uh, very much for the introduction. So the, the Shell Geomatics team uh, kindly offered me an opportunity to to share the story of the Brent Alpha removal. So this is um, uh, one of the four Brent platforms. Uh, and uh, the, I think the Brent story is kind of too large to fit into, into a single presentation. Um, so uh, therefore, I'm only going to present the Brent Alpha, which is the one which I've been most closely involved with over the, uh, the last couple of years. Uh, first thing. We need to do the uh, the eye test. This is the shell eye test. Um, don't worry, this is 90% of the text in the presentation. Um, in summary, this is uh, Shell's legal caution. Effectively, don't use this presentation as uh, financial guidance. It's a single story within a much wider Shell universe. Um, so first, a bit of context about the Brent field. I think everybody probably knows the Brent name, uh, maybe not necessarily what it's linked to. So it's a really iconic field. It's had a really significant contribution to the UK and Shell over its lifetime. So it was discovered in 1971, which is 50 years ago now, and started production in 1975. So at peak, it's producing more than half a million barrels a day, and it supplied a, a huge proportion of the UK's gas as well. Um, and this is where, when people talk about Brent crude, or the Brent Commodity Index, this is where the name comes from. So it's, it's been a really important part of the UK economy. It's paid out a lot of tax, to the exchequer over many decades and it's touched thousands of people's lives so a very large number of people have worked on these platforms uh, and spent significant portions of their life on these platforms so the, the story i'm sharing today is, is really only a small part of what is quite a much much larger story about decommissioning the brent field and that in and of itself is also only a small part of um, the brent history and the history of the north sea um, so I mentioned the Brent, the Brent Fields uh, four platforms. Uh, the one I'm talking about today is Brent Alpha, which is the smallest of the Brent platforms. It's the only one mounted on a steel jacket. Um, and uh, so, so at the end of its productive life, okay, you need to remove a platform. So we heard earlier uh, from, from Neil about how we approach this. And so this is really looking at the end of life removal aspects. So I'm not going to get into the plugging and abandonment um, or the dismantling in this. 
Um, so this is how Brent Alpha looked in 2019. Uh, so this is really at the end of its life. It ceased production in 2014. At one point, though, it was producing 75,000 barrels a day. Uh, and it's quite a large platform. Uh, so it's 17,000 tons of topsides, and it's on a 142-meter jacket, which is um, a derogation case. So we have to ask the question, okay, how do you remove a platform like this safely? And that's that's what I'd like to explore. So the way we tackled Brent Alpha was... Uh, four stages for the removal. Um, so it ceased production in 2014, and there was a period of uh, plugging and abandoning the wells, and then a campaign to prepare the top sides for removal and downman. Uh, I kind of started working on this in 2019, which was um, where we were really finishing the, the top sides prep. And so to prepare the top sides, you need to disconnect it from the jacket. Um, but we decided to leave the legs connected over the winter. So that was to survive winter storms. But we took everybody off and downmanned it at the end of 2019. In May 2020, we came back with a construction support vessel called the Oceanic to rebore the platform and finish cutting the legs. And then in June, came with the Pioneering Spirit, which we used for the, the Brent, Al Brent Delta and Brent Bravo platforms to remove the top sides in a single lift. In August, we then returned to remove the upper jacket. So the, the, the footings of the Brent Alpha jacket are a derogation case. Um, and this is for a variety of reasons. So it's a very heavy jacket. It's quite an old jacket. Uh, it's very challenging to remove the footings and there's a cuttings pile around them. The dismantling stage. So we also then cover quite a wide geography. So you can see where the Brent field is here. It's right up between the Shetlands and Norway. The top sides were transported to the Able Yard and Hartlepool, and then the uh, substructure, so the upper jacket, was then transported to the AFD Com Yard and Vats in Norway. So this is where it, this is where it's all ended up in uh, 2020, uh, but we'll go back to 2019 and kind of go through how we got there. So I've had to cherry pick quite a few pictures. There's, I mean, there's an unbelievable amount of work which has gone into doing this, um, but these were some of the, I think, the best pictures from the top sides um, prep campaign. And just to give you a bit of a flavor of some of the work which uh, which went on here. So to prepare a top sides for a single lift, you need to disconnect all the risers and the caissons and all the different parts which connect the top sides to the jacket. So here you can see rope access technicians. So these guys are abseiling down below the deck to uh, cut through risers, rig them up, lift them to uh, the top sides. We also installed what are called bearing blocks so this is a technology invented by uh, the top size lift contractor, All Seas. And these are these large white blocks. So they had to be rigged into position, scaffolding put around to allow welding of them, uh, and welded onto the legs. And these provide gripping points for the pioneering spirit when it lifts the jacket. So it lifts the top sides. I think this is probably the best picture from the, uh, uh, the, um, the um, top size prep campaign. So you can really see the kind of work we're doing. Um, we use uh, rats extensively, so rats are rope access technicians, and we achieve some really impressive work quite safely. Uh, so these guys are hanging below the deck, chucking ropes to each other so that we can cross haul a section of riser out from under the deck and onto the top sides. So at the end of uh, the summer in 2019, you have to have someone who's the last on the platform to turn off the lights. And so this is uh, these are the last guys from the ops crew in their flight suits turning off the lights before they get on the last helicopter off the platform. And that was, uh, that, so that's the end of the kind of the man phase and the operations phase for, for Brent Arthur. So coming into 2020, and this is going through the three campaigns. So the first campaign we had to tackle was leg cutting. So the first question is, okay, so we, we said we weren't going to put people back on and then we, we have to come back to cut the legs. Uh, so how do we do this? So we came back uh, with all seas and uh, construction support vessel and a, um, a uh, motion compensated gangway. So this allows us to reboard the top sides without helicopters or um, without a flow tail. So this was, a, this was a really powerful approach. So we were able to use a relatively small, relatively inexpensive vessel um, to uh, house folks uh, who were doing the work. And the gangway then kind of let us use this in a really flexible way to access different parts of the platform at different times and not need to restart any of the platform systems. So we avoided remanning. Which um, which saves a, a lot of cost. 
So the scope for uh, doing these leg cuts. So we cut the middle two legs already. So Alpha's got six legs and we had to come back to cut the four corner legs. These had been left in place um, to keep the platform secure over the winter through winter storms. Once we entered the summer, we were confident that we could uh, cut the legs. So this was achieved with the rope access work again. So we re the top sides, had uh, teams of rats who abseiled down the legs and made uh, what are called castellated cuts. So you can see in the, the picture on the left here, these are kind of jagged castellations. Um, so this is a an engineered cut. So all sees a lot of structural engineering to prove this. What this allows, it means that the, the upper and lower parts of the leg interlock together and can't slide relative to each other, but they can be lifted vertically. So this means that the top side is held in place to weather winter storms. So weather any spring storms, but can also be lifted vertically by the pioneering spirit. And these are just two of my uh, favorite pictures from this campaign. So um, I spent a lot of time watching these guys work from the from the vessel. And uh, what what the rope access techs do is is really impressive. Absolutely down over over the sea uh, to perform quite complex and um, very technical cuts, which needed to be really precise. So that we did that campaign in um, about two weeks, and then uh, sailed out of the field. So you can see um, this is Alpha uh, being left to be picked up basically by the uh, Pioneering Spirit. And you can see uh, the concrete legs of Brent Bravo in the background and then Brent Charlie sitting behind it. So in June, we came back with the Pioneering Spirit. So this is the same vessel, same methodology that we used for Brent Bravo and Brent Delta. And uh, Shell and all sees uh, pioneered this method to an extent. So we, the advantage of doing this rather than say uh, the approach taken for Miller, which Neil shared earlier, is that instead of taking modules off one by one and having large numbers of personnel offshore for a long period of time, you can do a single lift very quickly um, with very few people involved. This is all mechanized. So the pioneering spirit comes in around the platform and you have to wait for calm weather, latches onto the bearing blocks, which were installed in 2019, and picks the whole top sides up, all 17,000 tons, in about 10 seconds. It's then able to sail away, sail away with it and place it on a barge. So you can see it just edging in around the platform here. And this is a great picture. So um, this was taken with a drone. So this is just after the, um, the fast lift had been completed. So there's two stages to the lift. First, it needs to come in, latch on, get attached to the bearing blocks. Then there's a fast lift mechanism achieved using hydraulics. And then the vessel deballasts further to get um, additional clearance before backing out. So you can see uh, this is Brent Alpha then carried and uh, lifted away from the jacket, just leaving the jacket to be recovered. So a really impressive methodology. And it's, it's, got, it's got pluses and minuses. So the big plus is you reduce some of the offshore exposure, but then the downside is you need to do more preparation work to achieve this. We think it's a very good trade-off at the moment. The next st step with the uh, top sides then is to transfer it to a barge. So the pioneering spirit um, is then carrying it to a sheltered location where a barge then goes into what's called the slot between these um, two kind of catamaran sections. And the barge is pre-prepared with sea fastening to uh, take the weight of the top sides and as well, as well as the skid system. So it's lowered onto the barge. And so we end up using very few days of the pioneering spirit. The barge was then towed to the Able Yard and Hartley Bull in the UK. This is where Brent Delta and Brent Bravo have both been sent for dismantling. Um, and the, the top sides are then skidded onto a key where it currently is being dismantled in uh, Hartlepool. So that's part two. That's uh, taking the top sides away. We then get on to uh, step three, which is removal of the, the jacket. All right. And this was a campaign we did with Herrera. So during Brent Alpha, we used both of the world's largest heavy lift contractors, which was it's a real privilege to be involved in this and to, um, to, to see these enormous vessels. So these are the only other two slides with a text on them, uh, just to give you an idea of the scope, because it's all underwater, so it's harder to get nice pictures. Um, 
here we're only removing the upper jacket structure. So um, this is a, a derogation case. So the footings are left behind. So you can see the um, the piles in this picture on the top right. Um, there's also what, what I found really interesting watching all the ROV footages. There's an enormous amount of lophelia and cold water coral down there. So so I I think coming away from it, uh, I'm someone who, I uh, like most people in Charlotte, she cares quite passionately about the environment. Um, it, it doesn't feel like you're leaving something which uh, doesn't have a place there because it's been so heavily colonized, colonized by uh, lophelia. It's, it, there's an amazing artificial coral reef down there. Um, so the activities to remove this is about a 10,000 ton lift. The other really special thing here is we took the conductors with the jacket. So normally uh, you would remove the conductors with um, the Wells team. So you'd have a rig on board the platform and that was um, one of WBS's alluded to earlier, uh, where 50% of your cost is in your wells. And that's because you've got a large team offshore removing both wells and conductors. In this case, we were able to leave the conductors and then secure those and take them with the jacket. So this saves a lot of offshore exposure and then they can go onshore to be dismantled. Um, so the work here was to create safe access to the jacket, install spreader bars to, um, to pick it up, install what's called the conductor hang-off frame to carry the, uh, the conductors, secure the conductors, and then um, install restraints on some of the bottom elevations. There's also a very significant subsea scope here. So to cut the jacket, we had to make 43 structural cuts. And some of these cuts are really large. You can't see it above water, but the Brent Alpha legs flare out below water to a 7.3 meter diameter. And these were um, what we call the pontoon legs. So they were uh, ballast tanks which were used to install it in 1976. So cutting these then needed an enormous diamond wire cutter. So the bottom left picture shows the world's largest version, which was originally built for Murchison and then adapted for this project with a, with a project engineer in the middle of it for scale. Um, there are a few other cuts to be made subsurface, but is, cutting these big legs was it was a real challenge. The Sleipnir uh, is a really impressive vessel. So this is uh, this was launched by Herum, I think, in 2019. It's one of the first vessels uh, in the construction market to run on LNG, which was a decision they made with a, with a lot of foresight, I think. And uh, they think it's great. It's very clean um, and it's uh, cheaper than diesel. So we've got a very large, very clean vessel. Uh, it's two, two 10,000 ton cranes. Um, uh, so, and it already completed a lot of very significant lifts. It's, it's great to be on board these kind of vessels and um, see it's, it's an amazing combination of people and machine, which achieves some, some really incredible stuff. So first we had to uh, prepare the top of the jacket. So we lifted across uh, rigging platforms and then onto the rigging platforms, lifted uh, walkways, built scaffolding out around the conductor bay, around the leg corners, uh, loaded welding containers and a safety container on board. And then all the access was from the slide now. So we didn't need to put any people on board except to do work. And you can see here the, the jacket in front of the, the slide now. And it was really a challenge to get a, a picture of this thing because it's, um, it's so large. The next step was uh, then securing the conductors. So you can see there's this, uh, this large girder structure, which is placed across the middle legs. And from that, we then secured and hung off all the conductors. And this was a variety of techniques. Some of them were welded, some of them were with grippers because there was uh, over the, uh, the lifetime of the platform, there'd been a range of different conductors used and uh, put in place. Most of them were secured with uh, what we call ball grabs or lift block tools. So you can see these on the deck, they look a bit like Daleks. They get lowered down inside a conductor and then pulled up. And as they get pulled up, the, the effectively giant ball bearings in there pop out and grip into the conductor. Because some of the conductors were quite old, they were an old sort called talon conductors. We had to secure them from the bottom rather than the top because they weren't very strong in tension, which is um, where this quite ingenious solution came in. Once the conductor was secured, we could start putting on um, the spreader bars. Um, so these spreader bars were, would normally be large lifts in their own right. They were installed on the A, uh, uh, so rows one and three, and welded in place. So you can see uh, these uh, small welding platforms around where the welds are. I haven't got many pictures of the subsea because uh, it's difficult to take pictures of subsea, <laughs> except taking screenshots of ROV footage. But uh, we spent a lot of time watching ROV footage. Um, it's an amazing number of fish down there. 
So once um, legs were mostly cut, and we had all the conductors installed, spreader bars installed and welded and uh, verified, uh, we came to what we call uh, the red cuts. So a, most of the cuts are what are called green cuts, so they can be made without any weather restrictions. And then there's a final set of four cuts which need a weather window. So you need to then have a very good weather forecast, look forward and confirm you've got enough time to lift and sail with the jacket with some margin um, before any weather picks up. So we had a, a pre-lift meeting, agreed, okay, we've got enough uh, weather window, uh, made these final cuts and started rigging up. And you can really see the scale of uh, the 10,000 ton block here with the, the guys working to secure the uh, the grommets around the spreader bars. The lift was about an hour, hour and a half. And this is also, this is another great picture because you can see the rest of the Brent field in the background. And you can see the Maersk Falls are working at uh, Brent Bravo, recovering the last of the oil in the uh, GBS cells. The jacket was then transported in the hooks. So it's uh, carried in the hooks. There are two kind of grippers at the deck level, um, which then sat around the uh, the legs uh, of uh, the bureau. And they were just to, to stabilize it. But we, we had fantastic weather in, in August and um, no problems with the sail. The jacket was then uh, put on the key side at VATS. So loaded in, uh, spreader bars detached and reclaimed by, um, by the slightly. Uh, and it's been uh, dismantled. So um, I should have put a picture in actually, It's but there's not much to see anymore because it's in very small pieces and it's gone for recycling. Uh, so most of it goes to uh, Celsius Steel in the north of Norway and has turned into reinforcing bar uh, for buildings. Um, and then the last, uh, one of the last slides I've got to share. So this is then what Brentfield looks like after after the Alpha campaign. Um, so Charlie ceased production this year, and that's the the last of the Brent platforms, and that'll be lifted in uh, in the coming years. The uh, well abandonment is uh, currently in progress. Bravo and Delta uh, are still sticking above the surface, um, and they are also derogation cases. So the top sides were taken the previous years. The alpha footings will be left as is, um, and there's no further work to be done there. Um, yeah, uh, okay, this is another nice picture of the Brentfield and you can see uh, Statfjord out in the background. So this is uh, Charlie is the last, last man standing. Thank you very much. Happy to field some questions. Thanks very much, Finley. That was, uh, that was really interesting and uh, really enjoyed that. Um, nice, nice project to work on. Hey, using, uh, using two large vessels like that, um, prestige vessels, I guess on the same project. Um, so um, we've just got a question from Nikki, um, just talking about the, the I guess, the, the derogation uh, part of that. How much, how, how, how high were the, was the structure that you left in place? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not, I, I have to do some mental maths because we cut it at minus 85. So it's 85 meters below the water level or mean sea level. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah about 60, 60, 65 meters. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you were saying that there's quite a lot of uh, marine growth on there and it's quite, quite a nice. Uh, so, so what species of it were, were growing on there? Uh, Lophelia, Lophelia patusa. So, so we actually performed um, some sampling for the University of Edinburgh. So we've got an ongoing partnership with the University of Edinburgh and they're looking at the dispersion of coral through the North Sea mm. and the role that man-made structures have. Um, it, it's been there for 45, 50 years and it's got really very large coral growths mm. and it's also undisturbed by fishing because you've got a 500 meter exclusion zone around the platform. Mm. Um, so when the we had to clean off some of the marine growth to be able to get the cutters in and uh, we also got the ROVs to bring up some samples which we sent to the University of Edinburgh and then they're looking yeah. at how the corals dispersing around the North Sea and rebuilding reefs, which used to exist. Well, that's interesting. Um, okay, so um, thanks for that. Um, 
So um, you, you you started off with some roped access to uh, to cut the legs, and you had your castellated cuts and stuff like that. That, that looked quite interesting. So how long how long did the rope pack, rope task access work take, and and kind of how many people were involved? So in the the top sides prep campaigns, um, that work went over a series of months, and we had. Uh, I think it's a POB. We we're mostly running at maximum POB. It was about 140 going off memory offshore. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of those guys would have been ops crew as well as construction guys. In the leg cutting campaign, when we came back with the vessel, um, we had about 15 rope access techs with us. So we we're working with a, a fairly small crew. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well that's that that's interesting. And to you know, to plan all the cuts and, and, and whatnot and it and it being an old platform, um how how did that go? Um did you have to use, you know, f- you know, fifty, sixty year old drawings or uh yeah. how was that? Yeah, yeah, the, I mean all, all the um we we actually went back to look at the, the uh, daily progress reports from when it was installed. Um Harem are actually installed the jacket back in 1976, <laughs> yeah. and the the DPRs are they're fascinating because they were doing it over the course of months and then installing the top sides. And there were multiple vessels coming backwards and forwards and storms because it was um, I think it was in the middle of one of the oil crises. So there's this mm-hmm. real pressure to get this thing into production. Yeah. It's a different universe. So okay. um, yeah, it, it was all working off the original drawings. So it was okay. it was built in built in Fife. And okay. um, yeah, it's it, it's it's interesting to be kind of involved in one of these um, bits of industrial history, and there's a bit of archaeology yeah, associated yeah. with it. Yeah, was it was it, did you have um, trouble compiling uh, and and finding all the information? Because obviously it was all was it all paper or, or digitized or what? It's, it's mostly it mostly been digitized. Yeah, there, there were okay. there's and then there's a whole bunch of paper. Uh, backups so sometimes you have to go to the archive folks and ask them to scan some stuff in which yeah, nobody's yeah. seen for years yeah yeah so there's a bit of a uh, bit of investigation to go on as far as that goes i guess um okay thank you um and 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 you you uh so you you made the cuts the castellated cuts and and then left them for a period was there was there any movement in in between times no. Um, no, no, no. The, the castellated cuts are uh, locked together uh, yeah, very solidly, yeah. and um, that was that was done on the basis of a mix of mid ocean and structural assessment. Yeah. Okay. So there's a fair bit of analysis that goes into it to make sure it can only move upwards instead of kind of laterally in any direction. Yeah, there was there was a lot of finite element modelling which was done by all seas to to prove okay. those cuts. Yeah. Well. Okay. Um. Well, Mark's Mark Grove Smith's asking. Uh, a question I might know the answer to, but uh, uh, did anything go wrong? <laughs> yeah, I, the only comment I'll make is that these these old structures always have uh, have a few surprises. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But in in general, it was a very smooth campaign, actually. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and I guess, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I was interested to uh, interested about the process for for how you go around deciding the weather window for the Sleipner to take the uh, jacket back from its location to Norway. What's the process for what was the process for that? So that that, that one um, that one was actually quite interesting. So the hydrodynamic characteristics of the Sleipner and the other heavy lift vessels. Um, in that class, like the TL for the Balder or the S7000, uh, are pretty special. So, so they're more roll and natural period sensitive necessarily than HS. So, short choppy seas don't really bother them, but long period swells can cause them to roll. So, we they had a marine engineer on board, and we also put a motion reference unit on top of the the jacket, um, and we're looking in detail at the forecasts for peak period in particular. Um, and uh, basically trying to avoid where we'd have a uh, coincidence between the natural roll period of the slight near and the peak period of the waves. Mm-hmm. That is more interesting than HS most of the time. 
Um, there's a substantial analysis done by Herama with dynamic models onshore as well beforehand to try and determine, okay, what's an acceptable weather window for lift? Um, what's our maximum HS and where are our kind of risk areas for, for peak period? Or, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so, so that aspect's quite interesting quite interesting but so before you have a lift you get the master superintendent client rep which is myself in this case oim um uh, marine engineer around the table and you look at these uh, these long range weather forecasts and uh, make a determination of what the vessel responses are so they do it response based um a lot so they say okay we we can find a weather window where we're going to be rolling less than half a degree mm -hmm. okay so uh, that, that has to be a continuous weather window i take it yeah. The, the, the slope near sails very fast, so it's been designed to be a quick vessel. So mm -hmm. the the uh, transit time is quite short. So, it was so about, what, what was the transit from from Alpha to um, about twelve to eighteen hours? All oh, right, okay. To, to safe yeah. harbour, it was pretty quick. Yeah, clipping along then, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, th uh, we've again, I could go on for ages, but I guess we've reached our time. Uh, thanks ever so much, Finley. That was really interesting, really enjoyed it and uh, enjoyed enjoyed looking at the pictures because you don't often get a good a good visual representation of a project like that. It's, it's kind of often a description or drawings and that. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to see some of the live i guess i was close to live images so that, that that was really interesting appreciated it so thank you very much great thanks and uh guys thank you all very much um uh, for, for, for spending the time this evening it's all very much appreciated and and this was a really good evening really enjoyed it uh i've had lots of great questions and discussions um, so thanks ever so much for your time. Uh, I just want to also thank um, the folks behind the scenes who, who organised this evening. We've had uh, Ashley and Nikki behind the scenes from the Hydrographic Society in Scotland Committee, corralling you all and organising you all and badgering you for biographies and stuff like that. Um, so thanks very much for that, guys. And also... Uh, lest we forget um, Laura in the background, she's doing all our producing and uh, directing this evening. Uh, and OK, so uh, look out for more from us, everybody. Thanks to the viewers for joining. Uh, enjoy what remains of your evenings and take care. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Bye bye.